Hello and welcome to the Vet Blast podcast. I am your host, Dr. Adam Christman, Chief Veterinary Officer here at Fetch DBM 360. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vet Blast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that sounds okay, about right. We'll do it again. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, you made me laugh talk. too much and now I have to like record again. I'm okay. Sorry. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vet Blast podcast. You know, a pyometra can be a real pain in the you know what, but we have some five hacks to help you and successfully remove that disgusting pyometra. And I can't think of anyone better to talk about with a board certified surgeon, Dr. Shadi Arefej in the house. How are you, my friend? I'm good, sir. Thank you for having me on. How are you doing? I'm ready to learn about this. You know, this is something that we see quite a bit in general practice. And I know the listeners will be really intrigued about learning uh, these tips, especially numbers four and five. So, okay. So to our listeners, by the way, who is Shadi Arifid, you said? Well, oh my gosh. Well, you got to come join us at our conferences because he speaks in the live events for uh, surgery tracks. He's fantastic. And he graduated from the State University of New York at Binghamton, where he received his BS degree in biology and then also attended Cornell University, received his DVM degree in 2006. After completing that, Shadi participated in a one-year small animal medicine surgical rotating internship at Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston, followed by two one-year small animal surgical internships at Long Island Veterinary Specialists. Dr. Rafage achieved his board certification in small animal surgery um, in 2012 and subsequently became a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons after operating for almost 10 years at LIVS, Dr. Rafage elected for warmer weather and transplanted to Vegas in 2016. And he became a staff surgeon at Las Vegas Veterinary Specialty Center. And he also joined um, a veterinary hospital called True Care in Los Angeles. And then he changed, which I love about veterinary medicine, by the way, how we can change and pivot and do all this great stuff. He changed gears uh, in finding a novel and state-of-the-art means of reaching concerned pet parents and their ill pets worldwide called Vet Triage. And he currently serves as their chief medical officer, which we're going to talk more about at the end about Vet Triage because I think it's fantastic, all the great work you're doing. And he is known for being a positive force and energetic force, both professionally and personally, and proud to call him a dear friend of mine. So, all right, my friend, hi, Amitras. Ugh, you know? And, you know, but, and I'll, I'll start right off the bat with, with we all know this, if you're in practice long enough, pyometras are not just gross and they could be scary surgeries. They're also frequently the cases that have no money right and so you're trying to figure out a way as a veterinarian how can i take care of this pet knowing that pyometra surgery is going to be curative for the most part and also not not try to break the bank for these people it happens all the time right people who don't spay their pets it ends up being sort of a, a connection there so very awesome topic to discuss it's got multiple factors to it not just the medical part and surgical part yeah you know thank you for mentioning that actually that you know I, you're right <laughs> <laughs> You're it's absolutely right with that. Yeah. It's always to be, you know, a, a, you know, a 12 year old Chihuahua that's got no teeth, it's blind, deaf, and now has a pyometra. And maybe the folks can spend 500 bucks at most, like from the beginning to end. That includes everything right. diagnostic surgery, post op care, and, you, and maybe borderline septic, hypotensive critical any surgery and all the stuff and so you're like how how do i how do i merge these worlds to have provide right. the best standard of care that i can medically but also be realistic for what this family can afford it happens all the time it's all the time right that's brilliant it really is all right so let's get into tip number one and this tip is more towards um kind of like taking a history and being a little bit more understanding of what's going on medically so talk to us more about tip number one Absolutely. So one of the most frustrating things in veterinary medicine, because our patients can't talk and we're going based on the pet owner's history, their recollection of what's wrong with their baby. If you have a pet, a dog that presents to you in the clinics with very generic clinical signs, lethargy, vomiting, not eating, we it frustrates us as veterinarians because because 90% of the diagnosis comes from history. But when you have very generic signs, you know what path is going to go down. Diagnostics, blood work, radiographs, ultrasound. So if you're able to sort of fine tune your history taking to break down those differentials a bit more specifically for that dog, pyometra is a great example. You need to have usually an intact female, 
right? You need to have a, a, an intact female that's got all the generic clinical signs or some of them, but also usually polyuria, polydipsia, and probably most importantly and overlooked, when was the last time they had an estrus cycle? Last heat, somewhere between four and eight weeks ago, prior to clinical signs beginning. And that should tune you in, it's not a slam dunk, you still want to visualize a pyometer and diagnose it, but that should at least tune you in as to that being on your list of differentials for a dog that's got a closed pyometra, so no, no vaginal discharge, generic clinical signs, a, a pretty straightforward history otherwise, how else do you narrow it down? That portion of the history will help greatly. When was the last heat? Four to eight weeks ago, plus ideally PUPD, regardless of open or closed pyometra, intact female should clue you in to have pyometra on your list. Excellent, absolutely. Okay, yep, so that's important, understanding when the last heat is, number one. Number two, this is an interesting one too to the listeners because we work in um, a different time for the better where we work with rescue groups and shelters. And this has happened to me so many times, Shadi, where uh, it says the S, you know, <laughs> that the dog is yeah. spayed, but yeah. yet clinically, I was like, mm, are they really? So talk to us about tip number two. Yeah, so the the, the dreaded stump pyometra, you know, um, it, those are difficult because they're difficult to diagnose first of all, because these dogs are gonna come into you with a history of being female spayed, and to diagnose the actual condition on a hormonal level or anatomical level, hormonal meaning can you, can you actually diagnose the uh, hormones, elevation in hormones that shouldn't be there in a spayed female, and anatomically meaning can you actually see a stump pyo, so a, a fluid-filled or pus-filled stump of a uterus, and also remnants of ovarian tissue, because that's a requirement to have a stump pyo. You have to have ovarian tissue there, otherwise where is the estrogen coming from? And so it's a very challenging one. And the, the biggest reason, the two biggest reasons why I see stump pyometras is either, number one, large breed dog, you know, a veterinarian, well-intentioned, didn't have the equipment or the staff to have adequate surgical exposure. And so now there's remnant ovarian tissue, right? Remnant ovarian syndrome. Or the second reason is the dog was adopted by, by uh, pet parents that want to save this dog from a foreign country. Maybe it was some sort of part of a, some sort of horrible history. And it comes to them adopted, already spayed, quote unquote, with no documentation of the spay or a prior weird diagnosis of all oh, the veterinarians from, uh, from this country said hey, she was only born with one ovary or something like that, which, are, which I haven't seen in my 17 years as a surgeon, I have not seen that yet, right? So a weird history, no surgical reports, and now showing signs of heat cycles, maybe vaginal discharge, PUPD, right? And then you go down that path. And so those two reasons are preventable reasons. So it starts off with having optimal surgical care as best you can for, to stay a female to prevent this from happening. And then once it does happen, you've got to figure out, it's got to be on your list. How do you, how do you pin it down that it's on your list? Because if you see a, fa a spade female in your practice, you're not going to think pyometra, despite the signs, right? You're just going to assume she was spayed correctly. And that's not always the case. Right. And I know we were talking offline about this, but I think it's crucial to bring it up at this moment about the incision size. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, talk to us a little bit about that and your experience, what you've seen with that. One of the, one of the um, pearls I like to stress when I give, when I give pyometra talks is surgical exposure. It's all too often that very experienced, well-intentioned general practitioners will try to create a small incision as possible for their spay. And it looks impressive. It's quicker surgery because less closing time. The pet owner loves it. Tiny incision. My, which means my dog is not going to be in that much pain postoperatively. Um, less chance of complications. However, if you are trying to operate on a large breed dog or a deep chested dog and you're working in those caverns, you, you need to not be shy about making a larger incision in order to, to get access to the ovarian tissue and that uterus. You don't, need to, you don't need to overdo it. It should be adequate. You can always make your incision longer if you need to. Start small and go longer. But that's point number one. Point number two is retraction. So I'm fortunate as a boarded surgeon that usually I have all the bells and whistles. I've got all the toys. I can have three assistants in there if I want to, right, to retract stuff and hold things. That's, that's me. Most spades are done by general practitioners. They're not going to have the staffing for that nor the toys. 
So you need to have not only a, a, as big of an incision as seems realistic for that dog, that size of dog, but also need to retract, either have somebody or something push those organs aside so you can actually visualize the ovaries and that gutter or self-retracting balfour retractors. Great solution. And if you do that many spays, I don't know offhand what a balfour costs, but I presume you can pay for that balfour in a matter of weeks or months if you do enough spays. It's worth it in order to give you peace of mind. And honestly, what's the pet owner going to be more upset about? A longer incision that they had no concept of to begin with or complications down the line like a hemoabdomen or a stump pio later, right? It'll be the latter they're going to be more annoyed about. And, you know, so, so yeah. you want to make sure you try to maximize your exposure. Longer incision, retraction. And how you do that is up to you, but I highly recommend it. I do see a lot of general practitioners that will call upon me to do their large dog space because they're afraid of them. And when I, when, I, when I inquire as to why are you afraid of them, because these are experienced doctors, they're really good. Uh, it's always technique like this. They could do these large dogs if they just thought about that, but you get to the habit, small incision, quick surgery, right? No assistance in the OR with you, no retractors, that you a big dog space scares you. Okay. You know, let's make that tip number three. That's a really good one is, you know, visibility and uh, incision length because it's important with, you know, to visualize what you're seeing. You're just talking about the gutters. So I think that's a great one. So let's make that number three. And uh, number four, I love because I know the listeners that are tuning in, you know that you go ahead. Oh, my gosh, you're, you're not looks great. You're ready to, like, kind of throw it down. Right. And then all of a sudden your knot turns into a guillotine and you're like, oh, gosh, you know, here we go. So this tip has to deal with suture type and not security. So tell us a little bit about that. So it actually, it, 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 point three actually dives right into this nicely because it, let's say you do have a slipped pedicle or the pedicle ends up rupturing on you inadvertently. Well, now you already have exposure. And if you don't have the exposure, at least now you know how to acquire that exposure for a bleed, now an actively bleeding pedicle right? You, you're not going to be, have the time or access to a specialist to close that dog up and transfer over to the ER. I mean, she's literally bleeding internally. You have to handle it yourself now. And so if you, if you already keep point three in mind, well, that also prepares you for a disaster like that. So that's, that's number one. Number two, as far as uh, suture goes, I often actually see general practitioners using way more of a, of a s smaller suture size than I would typically use. So if I have a very large, a large breed or extra large breed dog, it's going to be zero size, zero suture. If I have kind of like a medium size dog, I'm gonna go with 2.0 and then smaller, you can use your discretion, probably still 2.0, but maybe 3.0. And I'm always using PDS myself, um, just out of habit, really. I, I, there, I'm sure any absorbable suture is fine, but I, I would like to emphasize, avoid braided. I don't know if people even use braided anymore. It might be too old school now, but. Uh, avoid braided suture, but otherwise any non-absorbable suture should be fine. And I use PDS. Your your question really, really relates to how do I prepare for a disaster? So you want to make sure in your surgical packs for your spays, or at least on hand, sterilize our, your car molds and hemostats. Because you're gonna, that's the first thing you're going to grab if that happens to you where it tears, you want to find that pedicle. You don't care about the bleeding side of the ovary that's going to be, that's going to be removed from the body. You care about the gutters. And so you need to make sure you've got long instruments that can securely clamp. You want adequate visualization so you can find that bleeding pedicle and clamp it with your car malts or your hemostats. So then you can then now, once you have that bleeding under control, you can now gently retract that pedicle from the gutters and gently place your suture. This is where an assistant really comes into play because they can hold that hemostat or car malt up for you, right? Keeping that pedicle taut, and then you can simply place your suture. Now, what kind of knot you're going to provide? Well, do you do one or two throws? So if it's a large or extra large breed dog, I'm going to have two sutures on that pedicle. And probably one is going to be a transfixation suture, ligature, and the other one would be a circumferential. The uh, transfixation ligature, which is where the suture will go in between within the vessels, or if, it's, if you can't isolate the vessels itself, then at least in between that fatty pedicle, It'll go in between where you, you suture on one side and then flip the suture over and suture on the other side. It's hard to describe. You need to act, look at a surgical book, but a picture will describe it clearly for you. But if you're going to do a transfixation suture and a circumferential, I prefer the transfixation be towards the dog, right? So 
dorsal in that patient and your circumferential is towards the ventral because the transfixation suture, the reason why you use that one, it's more secure. So if you do have a ligature slip, it'll probably be the circumferential. And if that circumferential suture slips, it'll, it's the one that you placed ventral, which means you still have that transfixation suture that's gonna hold that pedicle and prevent internal bleeding. I hope that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it does. I, I like to back my needle in too. I don't usually use a needle when I transfix. I use the, oh, do you do that? Love it. Yes, 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 yes. So if I'm closing a thoracotomy, for example, where at some point your sutures between those ribs are going to be blind, I, I, I do the same thing. I use the blunt end of the needle to go to that chest. If it does hit against lung or hits against heart, it's blunt. It's not going to penetrate, right? Um, yeah. And the body has a natural you know, elasticity to kind of bounce off anyway, but you're not going to penetrate them if you have a use the blunt end. Same thing in this scenario. Absolutely. If you're worried about going through with the, the, the pointed portion of the needle and lacerating something, go ahead with the blunt end. Just make sure when you do that, you, you're, you're passing the needle in the same curvature, the same route that the needle is shaped. You don't, yes. you don't force it straight because the needle is not straight. It's curved, right? So you want to make sure that when you go through with the blunt end, you're following the curve of that needle. And you can make the needle straight. You can just bend it. That's fine. I mean, it's, it's pointless for this. But my point is you follow the curve of the needle when you do that. You should do that, you should do that anyway with any closure is you follow yeah. the curve. We just don't because like when you're closing sub skin, it's such tough tissue. It doesn't really matter. But if you're working with really delicate tissue or you're trying to close the abdomen of a ferret, right, you want to make sure you follow that curve because when you don't and you force it through the tissue, doesn't matter if it's viscera, vasculature, sub Q, skin, and you create a bigger hole. And now you have a chance yeah. for a super pull through and more tissue damage. It's unnecessary. I, I remember my professor at vet school, Iowa State, shout out. He always said, let your wrist go along for the ride. The curve's doing the job for you. And I always think of that too. Similarly, it's curved for a reason. Let it do its job. And then your wrist goes kind of just along for the ride. So, Absolutely. Yeah. If you're, if you're, imagine doing an enterotomy or an intestinal resection asthmosis in a cat, or I'll go back to the ferret example, where you have tiny, tiny tissue, super delicate, maybe even compromised from the foreign body that went through, right? You, that, that really matters. If you're performing a cystotomy in a cat that was blocked and has all this bruising on its bladder, right? It's so easy to tear. I, I've had to use 4.0 or even smaller suture size because it's such delicate tissue. So you yeah. don't want to force that needle through. It needs to it needs to follow the curve. I like that wrist analogy. It's great. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so last, last well, before we do the last step, I do want to cover one other thing that we're, since we're talking about ligatures, um, we, we do get questions a lot of, of, through DVM360 about spaying in general, which is so fascinating. And the other question that they get is about the broad ligament. And specifically in this situation, what are your thoughts about that when you have a broad ligament that can be somewhat vascular? Yeah, so most of the time with these with these dogs, intact females that are getting spayed, they're typically younger dogs, and they don't the only vasculature you have to worry about are the two ovarian pedicles and the uterine, right? That's pretty typical. And so the broad ligament, you can either through blunt dissection or sharp, sharp dissection break through it. You know, stay close to the to the um, uh, the organ itself. You know, no need to go deep there into the abdomen. But regardless, whatever your technique is, is, is fine. There's no vessels there. If you do have vasculature there, sufficient enough that you're, you can actually see it and you're worried about it, then you treat it as any other pedicle. You create your windows in the broad ligament, of course, on either side of the vessel, and then you would simply uh, ligate and transect the way you would any other pedicle. Whether you want to use a circumferential suture, um, that's fine. Whether you want to have two circumferentials, that's fine, or one, whatever your comfort level is. If you want to do the three clamp technique or not, up to you. Typically, once, you, once you're at the level of the broad ligament, you generally have already freed the ovarian pedicle, or if you haven't yet, it's still very easy to exteriorize the broad ligament where you've got perfect vis visualization of the vasculature. So it's not like you're not working in a gutter anymore, and there's not a lot of tissue right. in your way, right? So you can pretty much choose whatever technique you want, ligate it, transect it, look at it, make sure it's not bleeding, let it go into the abdomen, and then move on from there. If it's a small enough vessel where you feel you're at the you're on the fence, do I really have to take the time and the suture to suture this thing? You can try cauterizing it. If you're fortunate enough to have a cautery device in the hospital, uh, your clinic, then you can try and cauterize it and see if that's, that works. And um, what you may have to do is clamp the vessel with a hemostat first, and then place a cautery tip, touch it to the metal of the hemostat, 
and then that that electricity will zap the vessel and really give you a nice burst of of a ceiling and then and then you can look at it from there and, and when you let it go and, and see if it works so that's fine too if they're if they're really tiny i'm sure you know you, i've seen youtube videos of kittens being spayed where literally the the pedicles are just torn and just from just from the basal spasming that occurs through vascular trauma that's a standard response to vascular trauma that's provide sufficient hemostasis for a patient who's that small. I'm not that gutsy to do that, but you can, you, yeah. but I've seen videos like that where people who do a gazillion space, you know, their incision is literally a poke in the abdomen. So those are like masterful spay doctors, but regardless, um, small enough vessels, even if just through the tearing, it'll be a spasm and constrict and then hemostasis, but I'm recommending more of visualization and figure out yeah. if it's like this or not. Be safe. Absolutely. Great, excellent. Okay, our last tip uh, before you leave us. And so we have the animal recover, we did our surgery, and it, this tip has to deal with recovery. So talk to us about that. So what's what's really awesome from a medical standpoint about pyometra is that, that really it's a multi-systemic disease. Because because you, you may have just your straightforward, healthy, open pyo, comes walking in the door, fine, barely any clinical signs, just some vaginal discharge, intact female, you know, three-year-old, great, you know, but the ones that are sick, borderline septic, the liver enzymes are elevated, they've got azotemia, white blood cells are through the roof, they've, they've got hypotension, they're tachycardic, they have a, they're a mess, and then you combine that with the fact that it's an older dog, and it's been sick for a week because the people who own the dog didn't have the finances to even spay her, let alone now handle this. They've been trying to avoid it and band-aid it, right? So you have this mess of a case. So the post-op care is really huge. Because we know that that always, always E. coli is involved, always. If you culture the uterine pus, you will 100% of the time get E. coli. You can have more than one bacteria involved, and if you do, one of those bacteria will be E. coli, 100%. And E. coli is, are, are known to have uh, pathogenic and virulence factors that can hurt the kidneys. Now you have acute renal failure. Well, you want to see that's reversible. That matters for the long-term longevity of the dog plus post-operative recovery. So you wanna make sure you have, number one, adequate IV fluid, diuresing the patient. Ideally before surgery, if it is a TMX, you can get those numbers down, but frequently we don't have that luxury. We've gotta cut them right then and there. So you're diuresing them as you're prepping them for anesthesia and surgery. Number two, antibiotic coverage. So something like unison or an ampicillin, uh, a type of drug injectable, and then oral thereafter. Number three, all your cardiovascular parameters. What's their heart doing? So can you have ECGs on them pre-op, intra-op, post-op? And if you can, can you, can you continuous or do you do spot checks? If you do spot checks, QID is what I recommend doing. And again, again, I'm a surgeon, so I'm used to 24 seven care, but you do what you can if you're a nine to five GP, you do what you can while you're open and then, you know, arm the owner with warning signs and the next day have them come back in to reevaluate, right? Blood pressures, are they hypotensive? If they are, are, are you equipped to bolus crystalloids? Do they need, do they need colloids? Do, are, they, are their proteins low? Are they anemic? Those things happen frequently with these really sick pyometras. So being able to stabilize their blood pressure. So blood pressure monitoring, pre-op, intra-op, post-op. How often? Same as the ECG, either continuous if you can or QID and then treat them. And then if you treat, once you treat them with hypertension, recheck the value and see. Um, keep in mind, these are borderline septic patients. So do they, do they have hypoglycemia? If they do, 2.5% dextrose minimum in the fluids, intra-op, post-op. Um, have your staff wear gloves, right? We can communicable diseases from the human to the pet. So wear gloves, treat them like they're septic because they probably are. So those are all some tidbits of information there. I will tell you, I've had plenty of super sick on death's door pyometras that come in and literally that uterus is out and within hours post-op, they look fantastic. They're still oh. 15 years old with bad dental disease and blind and deaf, but they look fantastic compared to them being laid out, right? Septic, um, laterally cumbent when they come in. So they respond quickly, but but you need to be aggressive with these, with these patients and work within the confines of the pet owner, what they can afford, what you have at your clinic. Um, yeah. There was one more thing I wanted to mention. Oh, white blood cell count. So, so uh, if I have got a veterinary student or a young veterinarian and they've got, they're working up a dog that might have pyometra, they do their complete blood count, CBC, and they notice that, oh, the dog either has normal white blood cells or even leukopenic. Well, then it can't be pyometra, right? They don't have elevated white count. Keep in mind, the vasculature are where the blood cells live. And if the white blood cells are all in the uterus, 
They're not going to be in the vasculature. So you can have a CBC that's normal or even leukopenic and still have a massive pyometra. Keep that in mind. That does not rule out a pyometra if you have a normal white count or low white cells. It's not a mystery. The white, the white blood cells are not elevated because they're going somewhere. And in this case, they're going in the uterus. So I just want to mention that uh, point uh, briefly. Excellent. No, thank you for mentioning. Yeah, they're having a party in the pyo. <laughs> so, party in the pyo. <laughs> This is wonderful, Dr. Rafich. So uh, tell us uh, about Vet Triage and where we can learn more about you and Vet Triage. So Vet Triage is a 24-7 video teletriage platform. The idea is to tell pet parents whether they have a true medical emergency with their pet or not. 24-7 globally, English and Spanish speaking, any species, any animal type. And we find that over 80% of what a pet owner perceives as an emergency actually is not. And so you'll end up being on video live with a doctor within a couple of minutes, affordable, 50 bucks, as much time as you need to get that peace of mind. And if they determine that this is not an emergency, you get a sigh of relief and then you get told what to do, what to monitor for until your veterinarian can see you for a scheduled appointment in the next week or two or whatever is indicated. If you're in the unlucky 20% or less that have emergencies, we will find the emergency hospital for you. We will call in the on-call doctor. Whatever situation is there, as long as you have access to ER care, we'll help call you in. But at least now you know it actually is an emergency. You shouldn't wait till Monday morning for your vet to open. You should go tonight because this might be a pyometra. And so that way you get peace of mind in that direction and say, okay, this is worth getting the kids into the car, driving three in the morning, to an hour and a half to the ER to save my dog's life on a Saturday night because the vet on vet triage said it couldn't wait. And we get dozens of thank you notes a day from pet owners that are like, thank you, if I, had I not talked to you, I wouldn't have known it was an emergency. And they found X, Y, and Z. Or thank you for talking to me last night. I was freaking out. It was good to know it was not an emergency. My pet's feeling better already. And that's what happens all the time on vet triage. So vettriage.com, 24 seven, anywhere in the world, English and Spanish speaking, any species live videos with veterinarians and you're, you're living and breathing access to care and spectrum of care every day with what you're doing so that's wonderful thank you for all the great work you're doing it's awesome thank and, you thank you. we have got big challenges in the vet field and i don't see it uh, right. um, it's, it's not gonna be over anytime soon so we're here to help our colleagues on the ground get a better work-life balance we're helping pet owners all across the world get access to the spectrum of care you heard it here, folks. Dr. Shadi Rafidge right here on the Vet Blast podcast. Thank you so much for being on the show. My friend, thank you as always, anytime. Always good to see you, my friend. Thank you for tuning in. And everyone, don't forget to rate this podcast. I mean, this is like a five-star Uber rating, if you, can, if you ask me. This is wonderful. My gosh. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time right here on the Vet Blast podcast. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Vet Blast podcast with me, Dr. Adam Christman. Tune in next time. Remember, take care of your animals and always stay possum. Awesome.